Welcome everyone to our parent webinar, Prevention in the COVID-19 Crisis with Dolph Lundgren and Dr. Baller. My name is Michaela Pratt and I'm the President and CEO of Mentor Foundation USA. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization working to prevent youth substance use and promote health and well-being. We work together with the business community, government agencies, schools and families to empower young people to make healthy decisions and live drug free. We're also a member affiliate of Mentor International, which was founded in 1994 by Her Majesty Queen Sylvia of Sweden in collaboration with the World Health Organization. We're the largest network of its kind for evidence-based programs that prevent drug use among youth. And together, we benefit by sharing best practices, program development, and international networks to leverage our mission and expand the impact of our programs globally. We're very excited to be hosting this important webinar for all of you today and look forward to an informative session for the next 60 minutes. And I want to remind and encourage everyone to submit your questions to Dr. Baller, and we will do our very best to answer as many of your questions as possible. This function is available under your control panel. Please include your name, state, and if you're outside the United States, also what country you're from, along with your question. As many of you can probably relate, COVID-19 presents a rapidly changing situation for families and young people. Fear and anxiety can be overwhelming and cause strong emotions, and especially at children and teens. A few of the many things they might turn to in stressful situation is the use of alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs. Our hopes are that this webinar will help you navigate this difficult but important time with information every parent can benefit from. And to start this conversation, I would like to introduce you to our expert panelists, Dr. Ruben Baller, and our moderator, Dolph Lundgren. Dr. Ruben Baller is a top neuroscientist at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. He's an expert on drug abuse and addiction, and will help break down the complicated science behind drug use and substance misuse into information that parents and caregivers can easily understand and learn from. And again, you will be encouraged to ask your own questions to help shatter the myths around drug and substance misuse. Dr. Baller will empower you in this journey by sharing the latest research-based knowledge about health effects and consequences of drug use and addiction, and share resources for talking with your teens about the impact on drug use on health. And our moderator is the one and only Dolph Lundgren. Dolph Lundgren is a Swedish actor, director, producer, and martial artist. He grew up in Stockholm, Sweden, where he attended the Royal Institute of Technology. He originally moved from Sweden to the United States as a Fulbright scholar to study chemical engineering. After receiving his master's degree, he decided to pursue another career in show business. Dolph has starred in over 50 feature films, including Rocky IV, Masters of the Universe, and the Expendable franchise. But besides being an actor and producer, Dolph Lundgren is also a father of two daughters and an ambassador of Mentor Foundation USA. In this role, he supports our organization through a variety of campaigns and initiatives to help prevent adolescent substance use. And Dolph would moderate this important conversation today and take your questions live. And with this, let's start this webinar and I will hand it off to the amazing Dolph Lundgren. Thank you for that <clears throat> introduction. Uh, very impressive. Thank you very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be part of Mentor. And uh, yeah, you're right. Um, you know, I'm also a parent, not just an actor, and uh, and it's a tough job to be a parent. You worry about a lot, a lot of different things, and especially in times like today, where everything a, is uncertain, and especially for young people, they haven't really been through this, and they haven't had a lot of hardships in their lives. So it's quite hard for them to deal with the situation emotionally and and uh, and mentally, you know. Um, and I think you're right. It could be a, a, a situation where you could have more drug abuse and uh, people try to get away from reality to try to try to escape, which is a lot of time, which I'm aware of because, you know, when I was a kid, um, my dad was quite violent. You know, he was an officer, army officer. And, and an engineer, by the way, but he was quite violent towards me and my mother. So in my case, I know that situation from about when I was about five till about 12, when I moved to my grandparents. And uh, I hung out with the wrong people. There were a lot of people there who did drugs. Uh, there were a lot of people who uh, ended up uh, getting hurt, ended up in jail. And, and fortunately, I got out of it uh, 
early and I turned to sports instead, which was my way to escape. I got involved in martial arts and ice hockey and other sports. And, um, but I know that feeling of trying to get away from something and how you can really put a lot of pressure on a young person, you know, especially in your early teens when you, you're searching for who you are anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, like I said, I'm very proud to be an ambassador of Mentor USA. It's always been a pleasure. Uh, and um, of course, uh, you know, I've supported a society free of drugs where people can pursue their happiness and their dreams, you know, without drugs, being clear. And uh, also, I'm a proponent of physical fitness, as you may have seen in my movies. So I try to make that the, the drug of choice is, is uh, you know, physical fitness and health. Um, so anyway, um, today I'm very pleased to be involved here and be sitting here with Dr. Baller, who is uh, one of our great experts on this, in this matter. Uh, he's one of the leading scientists in our country here. Um, he works um, at the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And uh, um, we both of us going to try to uh, help people um, learn more about the situation, um, how, to, how to prevent drug use, and also how to, how to deal with it, and also to uh, dispel some myths about it. So uh, again, really happy to be here today. And uh, I was going to then ask uh, Dr. Baller, uh, what exactly do you do over there at uh, NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse? Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's also a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Micaela and Mentor, and thank you both for uh, joining us for this activity. NIDA is the biggest uh, research center institution for drug abuse and addiction in the world. We have a huge budget, uh, about $1 billion, uh, that we spend in basic research, clinical research on treatments and developing preventions. And one of our major a, a focus really in research and in what we do is adolescents, is young people. Because we know that addiction, epidemiological research clearly shows that addiction is a developmental disease. It's exponentially riskier for a young person to become involved with drugs and once they become involved to become addicted. So I'm also a parent like, like Dolph and, and all of you. Also have the, I, I had two kids, now they're grown-ups. Uh, and I wish that I was uh, told that somebody told me the information that we might be able to share today about the neuroscience, which I believe is empowering for parents, for kids, for teachers. I think that the foundation of a good prevention intervention is science, is evidence, and it's knowing what's out there to better understand our kids. So this is why I'm so happy to be part of this activity. I think that this information that we are about to share today uh, is truly empowering, and I'm looking forward to this. Terrific. All right. Well, um, should we start with these a couple of questions, general questions, maybe about about uh, kids and drug use? Absolutely. Um, okay. So, so I wanted first to ask you, uh, Dr. Baller. What, you know, um, uh, marijuana and tobacco. We know that's dangerous for kids and it's dangerous for well anybody who smokes it. Um, but what about vaping? Vaping is something that I hear about, I never did it because, well, it didn't exist back in the day. I never even knew what it was until, uh, you know, maybe five years ago. But what is vaping? And, and um, um, is it something that it could be dangerous in these times, especially with the COVID-19 virus? Yeah, there is no question about it. These devices have been invented many years ago, but now they have become very popular. They're being glamorized by companies that are selling things like Juul or e-cigarettes. These things have many different looks, they come in many different forms, but they all have an electronic way of, uh, of dissolving and creating vapors out of uh, drugs of abuse, like uh, nicotine or marijuana, for example. And the problem with vaping is that it's very difficult uh, to detect them. If a kid wants to hide his behavior, it's very difficult to find. And uh, they can get exposed to extremely high concentrations of the active ingredients, like THC, if it's marijuana, or nicotine, if it's this tobacco product. They could be vaping the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes in an hour. So whatever science we have about the effects of these drugs, whether it be THC or nicotine, the science that we have is almost irrelevant to really predicting the consequences of these new behaviors that expose these developing brains to such high concentrations of uh, neurotoxicants like nicotine and THC. So we are here in uncharted territories. These things are becoming more and more 
uh, prevalent. Uh, they are in fact uh, undoing decades of progress in terms of the prevalence uh, of uh, cigarettes, for example, nicotine, smoking. Uh, we've been going, uh, the numbers have been going down uh, dramatically in the last uh, four decades. Uh, but now we are reversing that positive trend uh, with this new the popularity of vaping and particularly nicotine that now has crossed uh, the prevalence of uh, nicotine going down that vaping is going up and is undoing really decades of progress in terms of uh, the epidemiology of kids being exposed to nicotine. So we are reason to be very, very concerned. And is the vape, so when they, when they, when you vape, you, you smoke nicotine, you can smoke nicotine as well, like a cigarette then, right? Right. You, you do away with all the risks associated with the combustion products of tobacco leaves, which is thousands of compounds. Many of them are carcinogenic compounds, uh, like tar, for example, and uh, more, uh, carbon monoxide, those things are not in the vaping, but they're new compounds in addition to the nicotine. The nicotine is there, it's is an even uh, increased risk because of the high concentration. But then we have other compounds that are used as vehicles to dissolve the nicotine. And those things, uh, like uh, polyethylene glycol, for example, when we uh, dissolve and melt, when these things heat up with electronic uh, fuse of the device, we don't know what's happened to a lung or to a brain that is exposed to high levels of these new compounds. So we are uh, taking away some of the uh, risky elements from the equation, but now we are adding new ones. And we are still having very high levels of nicotine uh, that are e extremely addictive, particularly for a young brain. And when you bring in now the situation with the COVID-19, we know from animal studies and from human studies uh, that vaping uh, really impairs the ability of the lungs to, to repair themselves. It brings down the defenses, the immunological defenses of, of the lung, and it can make matters worse when a person gets infected, for example, with the flu, uh, with the virus, or with the COVID virus. Now, we, can, we have reason to believe that the ability of the lung to defend itself is uh, much perturbed, and, uh, and that's also a reason for concern. Got it. Okay, interesting. So look, since we're speaking about the COVID-19, what about opioid, opioids? I mean, what about uh, all these painkillers? I mean, I, I've heard, of course, and we, most people have heard that the United States is fa facing a drug crisis because it's not like people are doing uh, street drugs anymore, but a lot of people are doing uh, are using um, uh, pres prescription drugs, right? A lot of painkillers and such. Um, yeah. uh, what's it called? Uh, you know, like, um, if you, if you do surgery, you get, uh, uh, what's it called? That one drug that everybody's taking, that's so dangerous. Um, analgesics where per Percocet or Oxycontin. Uh, yeah, those, Oxycontin. Yeah. Oxycontin. Opioid yeah. analgesics. Well, it's important for the parents to put the, these two epidemics in, co in, in context. If we look, if we contrast this epidemic with vape, with the vaping epidemic, uh, parents should be very, very concerned. When we talk about the opioid epidemic and the intersection with the young population, uh, I, as a parent, I would be a little bit less concerned because the numbers are not that high. Vaping is very popular among kids. Uh, we have a, a survey that we run every year it's called the Monitoring the Future Survey. And that survey shows that about 30% uh, of uh, seniors uh, have vaped in the past month, some product, 30%. If you look at the opioid impact on youth, it's about between five and six percent. So it's a it's a much lower number, and it's all constantly going down. So kids, unlike adults, they have not been impacted to, some, to the same extent as opioids. But going back to the to, to the question of uh, COVID and the impact of or the intersection between COVID and opioid epidemic, it is a concern. It is less of a concern for for the young adults and the adolescents among your kids, but it's still a concern how this uh, opioid epidemic might interact might collide with the COVID-19 epidemic because we know that opioids, opioid abuse uh, can, uh, can disrupt significantly the health of the lungs, the brain, the cardiovascular system is negatively impacted by chronic opioid use. Uh, and uh, we have all reason to believe that it could exacerbate a situation that is bad already for those infected with the, with the COV2, which is a virus that causes COVID-19. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um... All right, so since we're on that topic, everybody's heard a lot about social distancing these days. So, mm. you know, you see those lines in the supermarket six feet apart. And uh, 
I think what we should talk a little bit about then, um, because kids are very sensitive to this, social distancing doesn't mean social isolation. It just mm -hmm. means that, you know, it's a physical distance just to prevent us from catching the virus. But um, I think, um, you know, this could be uh, an important thing then I was going to ask you about, you know, that we keep connected to our loved ones using f telephone or messaging. Uh, so uh, so that teenagers, especially who are like suffering from anxiety or, you know, uh, various emotional uh, emotional distress already, that it doesn't get worse from the situation we're in now. Absolutely. Well, I would just uh, suggest the parents follow the advice of the, the professionals in this, in this context, and that would be the psychiatrist. And the American Psychiatric Association has put some guidelines out there and you can visit their website and uh, as I did when this uh, situation first came up, uh, these are very challenging times and what the American Psychiatry Association suggests in terms of dealing with their kids is first of all uh, to hear their concerns and make sure that they know that we are listening to their concerns and take them very very seriously. Uh, you have to make sure that they understand that we are doing everything we can to keep them safe and uh, uh, in this regard, it's important for families to try to establish some kind of a routine. It's important for the kids not to see that they, we are following those, those curves that we're trying to flatten every minute of the day that we're checking CNN or, or whatever news outlet we are checking, that we are not becoming obsessed with this uh, COVID-19 epidemic, that we are engaged in some kind of a normal routine. Besides being a challenge, this is also an opportunity for us to reconnect as families, if the family wasn't that, all that functional to begin with, this may be a, a good opportunity to, to, to revisit those relationships and move away from all this internet and cell phone and cybernetic interactions that we have constantly. I try to uh, nurture those human interactions that uh, we have uh, slowly been kind of shifting away from. So this is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. I would encourage everybody to look at the situation from that vantage view, a view and a look at the opportunities that it provides to reconnect with each other and to establish more loving connections. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, I know personally I've seen, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm on a filming uh, a movie location and the movie was shut down about two weeks ago and I'm still here um, in Alabama actually and you know you see more people out running, walking. Uh, not just by themselves, with other people. Then, you know, when I first came to America, like about 35 years ago, 40 years ago, it was like this because you didn't have internet. So on a Sunday, what could you do? Go for a walk, play some football, you know, go to the park, hang out with your friends. And I feel like maybe it's been a good thing as well for not just for kids, but for everybody. Like it's something, mm -hmm. I think, something positive. We realized, like, yeah, there are other things you don't have to look at a you know, at your phone all day necessarily. So I, I think you're right exactly. there for sure, you know? Um, all right, uh, perfect. So let's just move on now then uh, to some questions from our our viewers, all right? So, um, okay, I've got the first question here. Uh, it's from, um, okay, it's from Aaron Spurlock. He uh, He's at KR. CR ABC7 Reading California so obviously a, a journalist um, what are some actions parents can take to help reduce stress in children and teens in order to avoid them attempting to experiment for drugs and alcohol during this pandemic 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 what can we do to prevent well, that from yeah, I, I think that the keys of death not just in the pandemic but in general when whenever we are leading normal lives is boredom Kids have a natural inclination for taking risks and seeking novelty. And in this situation, boredom can really be the kiss of death that pushes us uh, over the edge. Uh, so this boredom is something that we need to, to avoid at, at all costs. So this situation calls for some kind of uh, creativity. So each family will find different avenues for, uh, for, uh, for doing this, for finding new opportunities for activities. But uh, it's really up to every family. In my family, for example, for us, it's an opportunity to create a, within the family like a book clubs or, or, or film clubs and uh, let the kids have their voice. Let's, let's them pick a movie, watching that movie together, for example, and then having a debate what that movie means or, or magazines. 
this is an, a, an opportunity for us to, to understand and to get into what kind of music the kids like and why, give them a voice. So they should become also the protagonists. And uh, this is an adventure, this is an uncharted territory. And th there is no magic bullet here. Every family is very different. Some families are more functional than others. So yeah, I can't really give you a straight answer because every family is so different. But there is an opportunity here, as you were saying before, and it's up to us to really allow the kids to be heard, uh, their concerns to be heard, and uh, giving them a, a protagonic role in this uh, new movie that we are all acting in. And, but they also keep in mind that if the coping becomes uh, challenging, and if you find that you cannot cope with the situation or the kids are becoming really, uh, not just unruly, but that they cannot cope, that the anxiety becomes uh, so high that uh, you just can't deal with that, there's always uh, professionals that you can reach out to and uh, you should do that if the situation becomes uh, out of hand that you don't know how to deal with. Okay, great. Um, you know, I also, um, what you were saying earlier, uh, as they call, um, they call compassionate listening, meaning you let the other person tell you how they feel, like, uh, mm -hmm. like to do in ther psychotherapy is quite efficient, I've found with my kids. Like if I just ask them, how do you feel about this? And instead of every time they say, well, I feel really bad, I feel, instead of saying, well, look, I know how to make it better, instead of, you know, trying to fix it, you just listen and say, yeah, that's, that's, that's right, you know, um, that is terrible. Wow, they shouldn't have done that to you, or that kid shouldn't have said that. Or So mm -hmm. I think, you know, if we can, instead of, like, instead of trying to kind of just um, ignore what's going on, if you try to, Embrace it with with your child. I think that's something that's a good way for them to feel better. They know mm -hmm. that you're on the same page and you really care what so what you said before. You really care what, how they feel about it too. Mm -hmm. Okay, terrific. So we have another question here from Sean in Denver. He says, "I'm a teacher and now having to get used to working with my teenage students in a remote online environment, which is not as personal as face to face is, of course." I'm also not able to see the visible warning signs of students who may be under the influence, 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 or those who are battling abuse. So basically, I guess this this is another teacher who mm -hmm. wants to know well, how can he deal with that situation where he can't quite feel how the students are, how they're how they're coping with this, you know, because he's just looking at them on a screen probably, or maybe a, just a text. Yeah, well, I know I know that the distant learning is, is quite a challenge. I know because my wife is a teacher and I, I, I end up spending quite a lot of time helping her with the, with the programs, with the YouTube videos and with the different distant learning tools. So I thought it could be a challenge. I would encourage any teacher that is concerned about their students to reach out not only to the students, but to the parents. And she should have an open channel of communication with the parents as well. So they can triangulate and to understand, to have a better view of the landscape, what's happening around that child, if uh, she can not only interact with, with the kid, uh, but also with the parents. Uh, at the end of the day, the responsibility of what's happening in the life of the kids is the parents, not the teacher, but I understand the concern. Uh, and that's a resource that she can, uh, she or he uh, can tap into uh, to have a better grasp of what's happening in, the, in that child's world uh, in these challenging times. Okay, very good, thank you. Um... All right, that's a good question. Let's see if there's anything else we got here. Um, all right, so another question from Tom in Maryland. Maryland, close to you. Uh, he says, over the years, there's been studies by uh, NIH suggesting that there's significant adverse effect of op opioids and other substances like marijuana and others on the immune system. This is particularly disturbing now since there's a clear link between those with a compromised immune system and their chances of contracting COVID-19. And the fact that there are tens of millions of people who is both legal and illegal are using these substances. So what can you say about that? Well, the, the, the pathophysiology or, or the process by which COVID-19 uh, happens in, in the body really has really two phases. One is the infection itself, is the virus attacking the, the cells in the lung and replicating inside those specific cells and causing disease. These are the symptoms, the respiratory stress and the cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular symptoms of the COVID-19. 
And then when a body cannot really rid of that virus in the lung, then comes the second phase, which is the immune response itself, the body trying to attack that virus and, and rid of that virus uh, through, immune, through the immune response. We don't fully understand who is at risk of going overboard with the immune response, but some people appear, appear to have a very strong, too strong of an immune response. And that's really what causes the, uh, the very acute kind of a presentation of the disease, those that requires of hospitalization, is when the immune response goes overboard and spills over and starts causing a innocent bystander damage to the lung and other organs. Uh, so th th that's what happens during the COVID-19. We don't really have data. We don't yet have research to know how the immune compromise uh, in people who overdose or who have an opioid abuse, how that really interacts with the COVID-19 course of infection. It's still too early in the research, but in the last four months, there have been already hundreds of articles being, being published on these interactions on COVID-19 and the, and the collision or the Hello. up with other things. So we can expect much more data to come uh, in the very near future. Dr. Baller? Phil, yes. I recorded, okay. I'm afraid I can't see. Something happened? Yeah, I think it's good now. There was a problem, but I think it's, oh, it's okay. you're back on. Oh, okay. I haven't touched anything. All right. I think you're good. All right. Okay, so so what I'm saying is just this research uh, portfolio is exploding. It's really growing very, very fast. Obviously, it's, it's an emergency, and people are stepping up to the plate, but it would be premature to say exactly how opioid abuse intersects with the COVID-19 uh, epidemic at this point at the physiological level. It's just too early. We don't have the data. Okay, I got you, man. Okay. Let's see. Here we have Danny. Okay, he's, uh, he's currently self-isolating due to the pandemic. First to Dr. Baller, how do you stay away from drugs when many of my peers are asking if I would partake in what they're taking. Hmm. Okay. Also to Dolph, how do you stay motivated to exercise? In my case, resistance training mostly, when I have very little equipment. <laughs> All right. Go, you go ahead, go ahead. Uh, you, why don't you do the first one? Uh, how do you stay away from drugs? Many of my peers are asking if I would partake, partake in what they're taking. Well, I think that uh, for me, the secret of uh, staying away, if, if, if I were a young person and I've interacted with thousands of young people in, in, my, in my career, particularly in the last 10 years that I do lectures and I, I go to schools and I talk to young kids, and I find that the neuroscientific information, knowing about the brain, how the brain works, what are, it, what are its weaknesses and its strengths, how it develops and what happens during brain development. I just find that that information is empowered. Knowing what's happening under the hood, so to speak, inside my brain while, when I'm an adolescent, uh, that's empowering information. So I, I would encourage any young person who has an inclination to uh, protect himself or herself from these uh, bad influences, these negative influences, I think that the first step is to become informed, to get educated and understand much more about the brain. We take the brain for granted and it's a magic, wonderful organ. And if we just knew a little bit more about how it works and how delicate uh, that function is, I think that we would go a long way uh, to protect it and stay away from behaviors that can damage it for a very long time. Great. Well, you know, um, on that note, I think what also is quite important, I mean, I know from my own background is, you know, if you have some emotional stress or some trauma, you, you become disconnected. You're you know, you may know that, the, yeah, alcohol is bad for your brain, but you still need to get out of your, your tr you get hit by this trauma and you have to find a way out. So, I mean, psychotherapy is quite good too. It's anything that can deal with your emotions, anywhere where you can express yourself, and somebody can listen to you somehow, you can blow, you can vent a bit of emotion, or it could be a good friend, or it could be, you know, um, could be a, a professional as well, so that you feel emotionally a little more stable and more connected. That way, I don't think you're as likely to try to escape through uh, drugs and alcohol, you know? Um, also, um, I don't know how old this guy Danny is, but uh, how do you stay motivated 
to exercise when you have very little equipment. Well, the same way you stay motivated when you have equipment, you know, it comes from the inside. It comes from inside of you. It, it's something where you got to pick yourself up and go, knowing that you're going to feel better when you're done, even if you don't feel like doing it. And many times I don't even feel like doing it either. I have to drag my ass out of bed or if I'm going to go to the set at six in the morning, I have to get, get motivated. And I know even if I do half hour, I'm going to feel better, even 20 minutes. So I think anything is better than nothing is the first, first rule. And number two is, yeah, you can do a lot of things at home with elastic bands. You can fill up like I've done gallon, these gallon jugs of water. That's, that's about four kilos. You can use them. It's about eight pounds. You can use them for doing different exercises with. Of course, you could use your partner if you have a partner to do push-ups and sit-ups. I actually have some on my Instagram that I did with my girlfriend. Leg presses that, you know, they just lean on you. I got those from martial arts. They just lean on your legs and you just do leg presses like this. Or you could do, uh, you can do bench press as well. You can do uh, rows when, when you're standing over them and you just pull them up like that, you know, with your arms. So there are a lot of things that you can do. And actually, it's kind of fun to... Uh, to break, to, not to sit on the machine all the time, but actually to be physically active um, as well. So I'm taking this as an opportunity to come up with new workouts and things that I'm, I'm sure I will use when this is over. If I'm staying in a hotel or if I'm somewhere and I can't get to a gym, then I'll probably go, or if it's really difficult to get to a gym, I'll probably say, I can work out at home. And actually, sometimes you get fitter doing that because you're not as lazy. You don't sit on a seat. Like at a gym, the machinery is actually... A lot of that machinery was designed for people that have injuries that you can't move, you know. But, I mean, if you're fit, if you're not injured, then you're actually better off doing full body exercises than just sitting there pulling one, you know, one lever. There's, you're much better off having to stabilize your body and working your core and everything at the same time. All right. That's it. <laughs> All right. Next one. Phil from Virginia. He says, my son stopped vaping last year after one year of heavy use. How concerned should I be about him getting the COVID-19 and experiencing serious complications? Dr. Baller. Well, I think we should, we're all concerned about COVID-19. If it, we, we don't really know how much damage he caused. Young people have, have it both ways, really. It's like a double-edged sword. You can do a lot of damage because you are developing your body and your brain but also if you detoxify and you stop using a drug or if you just if you move away from that toxic influence also young people have this amazing capacity this plastic capacity to recover and to rescue that function rather quickly so i would imagine that after a year of detoxification of or not using he's pretty much go back uh, he pretty much went back to baseline although i can't uh, say for sure because i don't know the individual situation uh, but I would be worried, like any father would be worried about COVID-19, uh, although I would suspect that he's pretty much back to normal after a year of not vaping. I don't know, I, I don't, also I don't know what he vaped, whether it was marijuana, just flavorings or nicotine, that also may have an impact. We know that people who smoke uh, vape marijuana, uh, that particular type of vaping, those vapors have been exposed to a, a sometimes lethal levels of a vitamin C a vitamin C acetate as a vehicle for the for the THC, and that has a, has proven to be quite uh, dangerous for the lung. Uh, some people have been taken to the hospital and uh, they need the ventilators. And in fact, we have several many deaths from these people who were using vaping cartridges that they got in the black market because they were they, they were exposing themselves to compounds uh, quite quite dangerous. So it really depends on the history of that vaping, which you are not telling me much about. But if it was just regular nicotine vaping, uh, like Joel, and he stopped a year ago, if he wasn't that heavy, I, I wouldn't expect that uh, he might have caused too much damage uh, a year down the road. Well, that's good to know. Thank you very much. Um, then we have um, Craig from Boston. He says, how can parents discern the difference between a teen that simply made a bad decision and a teen with a deeper issue. Well, I guess both of them are using drugs, but what's the difference yeah. between something that was just spur of the moment and something that's more serious? 
Again, I would say that the best people positioned to understand and to see the difference are, are the parents. Uh, and when that becomes impossible, you need to reach out for a, to a professional. Uh, kids that are in trouble, really in trouble with drugs, they start showing uh, signs that are quite stereotypic, quite regular and common. For example, uh, you would see a lack of hygiene, personal hygiene, uh, sleep deficits. These kids uh, begin to, to lose sleep. They don't sleep enough. Uh, their eating behaviors become abnormal. And one of the most notable examples or, or signs, out, outdoor signs of, a, of problem is their academic performance. Either they drop out of school, uh, they start uh, just not going uh, to school at all. And you can also use their uh, circle of friends as a, as a sign and symptom that something may not be right. Uh, the thing is that this day and age, we really have to be on top supervising uh, everything that is happening in the world, their, their uh, screen activity, where are they exposed to in the internet, what kind of friends are they going out with. You know what your son or daughter look like when they are healthy. And you will certainly know when something is amiss in their behavior. Uh, parents are the ones that are in, in the best position to tell whether it's just a bad mistake, it's a once, once in a lifetime, uh, an, an event that something happened that's a mistake that the kid recognizes as, as a mistake, and whether it's something underlying problem that is much deeper than that, that requires a much intense uh, uh, intervention. Uh, parents are in the best position to really distinguish between the two. Okay, that's important. Just to watch for those signs and to uh, keep an eye out for that. And, and and even if it happens once or twice, then you know, keep checking and make sure that any of those signs don't show up in the future. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, all right. So we have Deborah from Virginia. She says, as a mother of an adult former heroin addict. Okay, who is still on Suboxone. What, Suboxone? Is that a... Um, it's a medication. It's a medication, medication. For, yeah, for treating heroin addiction, opiate addiction. Oh, so it's like it used to have... Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, it's I like methadone. It's like methadone. Methadone, methadone, yeah. Okay, it's so... A new, a new generation of medications, like methadone. I got it. Okay, so as a mother of an adult former heroin addict who is still on Suboxone years later, how does his physician wean him off it? Well, that decision is a decision that has to be made between the patient and the doctor. Some people, some uh, heroin, uh, former heroin addicts or opiate ad uh, addicts, individuals addicted to, to opiates, can stay on a uh, medication maintenance for decades and still function perfectly in society, have a job and, uh, and, and function that way for many years, sometimes for the rest of their lives. It depends on the interaction between their past addiction and how their, their brains have adapted or have learned about the addiction and the recovery pathway. Uh, so as I said, some individuals, some patients will require that maintenance for decades uh, with no ill effects. These people can function in society and stay away from drugs. We don't view at NILA things like methadone, buprenorphine or suboxone uh, as, as drugs. These are medications and they save lives. So whether or not that has to be weaned off uh, and sort of taper off uh, until eventually you uh, come off of it. It's a decision that has to be made between the patient and the doctor, if that's necessary, uh, looking at the situation of that uh, specific patient. But in and of itself, the fact that somebody is on Suboxone for a long time is not a bad thing. It's like uh, some cases, if you are a diabetic and you need insulin, you will be on insulin for the rest of your life. So this is not that different. Or if you're addicted to nicotine, a lot of people use patches, for the rest of their life. So this is not different. It's not, it's not a sin, it's not a drug a addiction. A, it's, a, it's an individual, it's a patient who has been addicted to heroin and now is on medication maintenance therapy, MMT. This happens to be Suboxone. The decision has to be made between him a, and his doctor. Got it. That makes total sense. All right, so we have another one from Robert. Robert, I've been reading multiple re resources that discuss the scientific evidence that cannabis shrinks the frontal lobe of the brain and forces other parts of the brain to compensate. And that long-term use of cannabis will eventually decrease. Um, hmm. Can you talk about this? Uh, well, okay, so what does that mean? Like you use it and it changes your brain and other 
part, another part of your brain will compensate, but how did, would that decrease your long-term use? I don't understand. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure exactly what studies the, uh, uh, this person has, is, being, is referring to, but I can talk about, in general, about the neuroimaging data, the evidence that we have from neuroimaging of cannabis users, chronic cannabis users, particularly those who started during adolescence, is that there may be some uh, changes in the frontal cortical areas of the brain. Uh, very subtle changes that may have an impact on cognitive function. Uh, I don't know about compensation of other areas. I have not seen any evidence of other areas of the brain to compensate. But what I do want to mention is that uh, those findings, the findings that we have in neuroimaging, are not coming from longitudinal studies. They're coming from cross-sectional studies. What the, that, that means is that we are looking at the whole population, users versus non-users, and we see something in the brain of the users. But we can say for sure with the data that we have today that what we see in those users is the, has been caused by the cannabis. This could be a pre-existing condition that uh, was there before cannabis uh, use started. So it could be one of the contributors to cannabis, cannabis use and not the cause of cannabis because these are not longitudinal studies that follow the same person from before they ever used cannabis. So we don't have those studies yet. Uh, but we are in the process of doing, of monitoring 11,000 children uh, for 10 years to have that kind of data. So some of those kids will go on and use drugs, different drugs, but we'll have the longitudinal evidence to see what did they, those brains look like before they use marijuana and what did those same brains look like after five or 10 years of using marijuana compared to control subjects that never use. So those experiments are in the works. All the data that we have today, like the data that this person is referring to, is cross-sectional, is prospective, it's not longitudinal. So we can really never say whether any finding that we see in neuroimaging studies has been caused by the drug of abuse, only that there is an association, but not necessarily a cause-effect relationship. I got it. So look, so the frontal uh, lobe, that's where your, is that where your emotional social functions Actually, the the the, cort the, cort of the frontocortical area is, if we simplify the brain, is the area where you uh, plan long term, when you strategize, when you ponder the sequence of your actions, when you inhibit prepotent responses, when you inhibit emotional responses that come from a much mm -hmm. deeper part of the brain called the limbic system. So this is the CEO of the brain, is in the prefrontal cortex, PFC. I get it. Okay, interesting. Interesting. So that, that makes you more of a functional social being because that's where you kind of you kind of analyze something. You say, well, I shouldn't do this. I should do that. That's a better move. It makes you an adult. That's the part that develops the last, yeah. the brain. And that's why the kids, adolescents, have this tendency to seek novelty and to take risks because their emotional part is fully developed by the time that they're adolescents. But it takes until age 22, 25 for the PFC to become fully developed. So that imbalance in maturation, in development, is what causes kids to naturally uh, take risks. Got it, got it. Okay, cool. So we have um, the next question here is from Amanda Puff from Wisconsin. So she says, even if I've been sober for 12 years, will I be more likely to catch COVID-19? I guess you must have been having some alcohol abuse then in her past? Uh, well, the, the risk of getting infected with this virus it's, will not be affected by your past abuse of alcohol or, or any other drug. Uh, I, I don't think there is any relationship between that. So I, I wouldn't be worried about that, Amanda. I don't think that uh, your uh, having used alcohol 12 years ago, abuse alcohol or uh, on, a, on a regular basis or being sore for 12 years, puts you at risk, uh, higher or lower, of uh, getting infected with COVID-19. You are at higher risk of relapsing to alcohol use because that's the nature of the disease, of addiction. Uh, addiction is a chronic and relapsing disease uh, that involves the risk, lifetime risk of relapsing and using again. Uh, but I'm sure you know about that. All right, very good. All right, so let's see if we can find another question. Here's an, here's an interesting one. Um, this is from Daniel. I had a friend who died three years ago, when she was only in her mid-20s, from an asthma attack while she was sleeping. All right. Would vaping 
be a factor in this death and her death from this attack. Asthma attack, she was in her mid 20s when she was sleeping. Well, I don't know if she was vaping, he doesn't mention that, but let's say yeah, she was she, vaping. If she, if she was vaping on a regular va va basis, yeah, I would. I, I would suspect she wasn't because asthma patients are very careful with the respiratory system. So I think that she wouldn't engage in that behavior. But vape, vaping uh, definitely weakens uh, the respiratory tract and uh, makes the lung less likely to, uh, to heal itself after an injury or for a, an exposure to a toxic influence like a, a, like a COVID or any other infection. So there is a, a direct relationship between the two things. I, I would uh, encourage anybody who has asthma or, or any other respiratory underlying pre-existing condition to stay away as far as possible of uh, vaping uh, as possible. Okay, good. That's good to know. Um, terrific. So let's see here. Um, all right, here's another. Should I have a cup of coffee while I read this? Does drinking five cups of coffee this is actually, I'm, I'm vegan, so this doesn't have uh, any <laughs> caffeine in it. It's just my, my daughter made it, it's some other type of coffee. Anyway, but does five cups of coffee, drinking five cups of coffee a day, suppress the immune system? I've never heard that connection. I think that it's a particularly healthy beverage. Uh, it causes a dependence, physical dependence. It's not like any other drugs of abuse that causes addiction. Uh, I have never met someone who would rob a bank or or, or cheat or or, uh, <laughs> or engage in any other criminal activity to get his cup of joe in the morning. But it does create a physical dependence. If you are uh, dependent, physically dependent on caffeine and you stop, you quit, cold turkey, some people will develop withdrawal symptoms uh, that are stereotypical, that are typical of caffeine dependence. Uh, but I have not heard uh, uh, that connection between uh, uh, that, that you mentioned in this question between caffeine good. and immunity. That's good. I, I gave it up a few years back, but anyway, um, so, so it doesn't concern me anyway. But look, okay, good, good answer. Now, here's an interesting question. Lena of West Virginia. Is marijuana less harmful than tobacco or alcohol? Uh, we have to distinguish here between the populations. What population are we talking about? Are we talking about young people or adult people? Well, let's uh, talk about young people first. That's, that's a very important good. distinction. For young people, this is the wrong question. We are not ranking uh, drugs, at least in my institute, in terms of harmfulness. Uh, because every psychoactive drug, whether it be marijuana, the THC marijuana, tobacco or alcohol, they have a toxic influence in a very delicate and wonderful process of development that is going on in these brains. All these drugs, regardless of where they come from, they, they uh, interfere with this delicately choreographed process of brain development that engages neurotransmitters, chemicals in the brain that allow the brain to program itself during the adolescent years to respond to all the stimuli and all the things that happen in the lives of these kids to increasingly adapting and responding, and responding to the stimuli in a more adaptive way, in a more positive way. So this is the programming that is happening in the brains during development. And when you uh, self-administer a drug, you are directly interfering with that programming process. And we know that every drug will interfere with these programs and create corrupt programs, uh, behavioral routines in the brain. We know that drugs from marijuana to nicotine to alcohol, they prime the reward centers of the brain in, the, in a way that those uh, centers become more likely to engage in other behaviors. We talked for many decades about marijuana being a gateway drug, drug uh, meaning that if you use marijuana, if you engage in marijuana, you're more likely to use harder drugs, quote unquote, harder drugs later on. That is only half a truth. The truth is that any drug of abuse can be a gateway drug. Marijuana was the one that we picked on because it was very prevalent among adolescents and the epidemiological evidence showed that if you use marijuana in your youth, you are more likely uh, to use other drugs. But pharmacologically speaking, this is true of any drug of abuse. Any drug that uh, can interfere with those programming processes in the brain can prime the brain to become more likely to use other drugs, harder drugs in the future. There are beautiful experiments with animals, with nicotine, just nicotine, not marijuana or heroin. These animals have epigenetic change in the reward centers that make them more likely 
to respond more powerfully to heroin, for example, or methamphetamine later on. These are uh, changes that happen at the genetic level of these brains that make these animals more prone or more likely to use drugs later on. So any drug can be a gateway drug, as we as we uh, used to say before of marijuana. So that's something very important to keep in mind. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, you know, I was just, uh, as I was listening to you, uh, you know, it's interesting how people always use drugs of some sort, like even like the people in, you know, the Indians, they, you know, chew uh, whatever it is down in Peru, uh, cocaine leaves. And it seems to be some kind of process in the human brain, some kind of trying to, is it escape reality or is it, what is it do you think that causes that? You know what I mean? There's something like people, you know, Indian, you know, they drink, not alcohol. That was the white start of the alcohol that brought it to the Indians. American Indians mm -hmm. destroyed them. And, you know, but even like out in the, you know, these sort of tribal uh, uh, communities, people, they try to sort of, is it escape reality or what is it? What is what? it? That humans, humans are humans, but because rats do it too. Like you said, rats will do it if you give it to them, right? Right, and and we like uh, adults like a glass of wine every now and then. We like this uh, altered state of consciousness. But the problem with modern times is that we have access to drugs at concentrations that uh, are completely uh, unprecedented. You talk about the tribal cultures, for example, the coca leaf chewers in uh, in Bolivia, for example, uh, they chew coca leaves. And the concentrations that they're, they're exposed to after with this behavior are, are really a trace levels, are a fraction of what a person who snorts cocaine, for example, is exposed to. They're all of magnitude different. And the effects on the body and the mind are uh, dramatically different. They become dependent on these drugs and they use them because of the uh, hematopoietic uh, properties. They allow them to live at these high altitudes and, and their cardiovascular system functions differently. But this uh, really, the concentration really is key. It's like having uh, four coffees, for example, th throughout the day, or having 20 coffees in one, in one shot of a, of a venti coffee, uh, 20 shots in one cup. So the concentration that you get exposed and the time frame uh, during which you get exposed to this concentration has a very strong impact on the consequence of that interaction between the drug and the brain. So it's very different to chew a co one or a couple of uh, co uh, uh, caffeine pills coca leaves and injecting a pure cocaine as it's being processed uh, in these plantations or in these factories. So the impact on is very, very, very different. So this is so what's unprecedented and much more dangerous. I understand. So there's like the natural way, let's have a glass of red wine, like the Romans did 2,000 years ago, or the other binge way. Binge drinking, binge drinking. For or, or for instance, there's, a, you know, somebody's taking cocaine and refined it, and then it's extremely addictive, like a whole different level than these guy, Indians who are chewing the leaves. I understand. Right. Okay. Right. Good to know. I mean, it's, it's a very important distinction. For example, the opioid analges analgesics, they are our frontline defense against pain. And it, when it's used legitimately for a yeah. acute pain after operation, you can take this under supervision of a doctor very, very safely. But if you're exposed to a nanogram, milligram of fentanyl, this is synthetic opioid that now is coming from illegal labs in China, you can have an overdose without even knowing it. So the concentration and the potency of these drugs is something that really makes a big difference in the outcomes. So you really have, there is a relationship between the, the uh, emotional, psycho, logical condition of, of a person and the, uh, the, um, the ability to, to have access to these highly concentrated drugs that if you, you know, if this person has a problem and there weren't no drugs around, they'll resolve it in a different way. Right. I mean, because everybody has their tr problems, you and me, everybody else have some emotional issues, but, you know, some people that have them and they have the, and the drugs are available that's our problem. And if we remove the drugs, then the person has to find a different way to, to deal with their problem, whether it's psychoanalysis or something else. And it's not just problems. We have to think about the, the way our brains evolve. What are, what are they designed to do? Our brains are designed to do basically two things, seek pleasure and avoid pain. That's it. That's what we do all day long. We seek pleasure, 
and avoid pain. The pleasure that we seek is sex, food, going to the movies with friends. These are the natural rewards that we're exposed to. The problem is that in our environments, there are other things that can, that can give that pleasure for a short period of time. Drugs are very effective at the tickling the same centers in the brain that process natural rewards, like sex and food. But they do so at the exponentially higher level. Or like so, junk food. Junk food is another. Like, exactly, exactly. So that's look a at all the five people that are overweight walking around trying to exactly, dead, dead exactly. their pain. And, and that's the disconnect between our brains and our environments that we need to be much more attuned to, what we are exposing our brains to. Got it, man. Okay, cool. Here's the next one. Marianne Nevada. Does steroid use, either for medicinal uses, infections, or strength building, affect your ability to recovery from a COVID infection? Yeah, that's a question that uh, would be better addressed to, uh, to a physician. I, I don't know the answer. I don't think that we know the answer. It's too, uh, too premature to yeah, venture. Just too, yeah. But the steroids do interact with the immune system, depending on what steroid you are talking about. Uh, it, it's an, uh, there are, uh, some of them are corticosteroids, uh, you were not talking about the anabolic steroids that are used uh, in physical training. Uh, so I really don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't think we have the data to answer that question one way or another. Great, Dr. Bollockers. The next question is quite interesting, and I think it'll be uh, probably our last question um, this time. It's from Tim in Ohio. He says, my wife and I are enjoy we enjoy drinking wine at home with our dinners. Does that mean that we're conditioning our children? to be more inclined to experiment with alcohol as teenagers? Question mark. Yeah, this, is a, this is a tough question because uh, different families have different styles, different cultures. Europe is not the same as America. Different, uh, different places behave different in different ways and there are different uh, kind of pathways for dealing with, with this problem. I, I'm kind of torn with this kind of question because on one hand, I would think that if I were a kid in that table, and my, my parents on a regular basis do something that I'm not allowed to do, that's kind of disrespectful if I put myself in the shoes of those kids. My parents, like kind of, if, I, if I'm an adolescent and they know that I would like to drink, but I can't. So if they keep, in doing, the, if they keep doing that on my face, it's kind of a, not putting my feelings uh, at the forefront of the equation. On the other hand, if I'm an adult and, uh, and I'm uh, with kids who are, I don't know, five or six years of age, much, much younger, and I enjoy a glass of wine, uh, probably no harm done. But it really depends on the situation. I would err on the side of caution and try to avoid doing things uh, in their faces of an adolescent if I know that they would like to do it, but they can't because of uh, it's just not allowed. So uh, I think it would, it would be a sign of respect for their, uh, for their own limitations uh, if I avoid uh, drinking wine because they can. It will also show, it's a teaching opportunity, that I can self-control. I can control something that I would like to do, but because of you, because you are in the table, I can inhibit my impulses and uh, stay away from something that would otherwise give me pleasure. But because I love you, I choose not to. That's a good a good answer. It's a complicated matter. I, I lived in Spain and I've spent a lot of time in Italy and uh, lived in Sweden and America, and I know the cultures are quite different. And mm. for instance, Spain, they have very low rate of alcoholism. I mean, people don't binge drink and things like they do in Sweden. Uh, but of course, in Spain, the parents drink wine every day and the kids yeah. are used to it. So it's a, it's an interesting issue. Maybe next time we can discuss it uh, more in detail. Next time. <laughs> next time. All right. Well, I think it's, uh, what I can tell is 3.59. And um, I just want to say that, uh, uh, 10 seconds that I really enjoyed this. It was really interesting for me as well to listen to you, Dr. Baller. I learned a lot in uh, things I can implement in my own family. And, and um, I hope uh, the viewers learned uh, a lot too, and hopefully we'll do this again. Thank you well, very much. To, You're, thank you. I, I hope we continue the conversation. There is a lot of resources, uh, parents, people can reach out to mentor. Uh, and I think that resources will be, will be posted for uh, people to educate themselves about these and related matters. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dolph Lundgren and Dr. Ruben Baller for joining us. We can't believe how quickly these 60 minutes went by. Um, 
We want to thank everybody at home for joining us for this important conversation. And uh, we hope you gain much information that will help you as parents, caregivers, educators, or any other role you have caring for and protecting our youth, and especially during these challenging times. And for those of you who were not able to get your answers from Dr. Baller now, we will try to post a continued Q&A online. And this webinar has been recorded and will be released on our website and social media. And for those of you who are not signed up for our newsletter, please make sure you visit our website at mentorfoundationusa.org. And everybody who's registered for this webinar will receive follow-up information. We also want to make sure you take a moment to note some helpful resources we listed on the slide. This will also be emailed to you, so don't worry about writing it down. If you found the session informative and helpful, we also want you to please consider making a contribution to Mentor Foundation USA so we can continue to offer support to youth and families in this great time of need. And again, on behalf of Mentor Foundation USA, I want to thank our panel. I want to thank Dr. Ruben Baller and our ambassador, Dolph Lundgren, and everyone at home for joining us on this Sunday evening. We wish you a wonderful rest of your Sunday and look forward to staying connected with all of you. And that concludes our webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take care.